Welcome to episode 46 of the Beyond Social Media Show. I am David Erickson, your co-host. You can find me at e-strategyblog.com and on Twitter at D. Erickson. I am with my co-host, B.L. Ackman. B.L. you can find at maximum-plus.com for all things Google+. Plus. On uh, Twitter at What's Next. On her blog at whatsnextblog.com. And she writes for Ad Age as well. And as you know, we have uh, the best and worst cases of the week for uh, communication, social media. Uh, we tackle so we uh, look at some shiny new objects, and then we uh, wrap it up with some stats that you want to know. But we'll start it off with the worst case of the week. And Yell, as usual, you have the honors. What was uh, what was bad this past week? <laughs> there were a couple, but A um, and W had a really stupid hashtag. Another example of a gimmick that doesn't work as an ad on Twitter. Uh, they came up with a hashtag that's basically the opposite of what you're encouraged to do on social media, which is to use short hashtags to get a point across. So they had a hashtag that's about 600 lines. It says, handbread chicken tender Texas toast sandwich. And that was the hashtag. And uh, they were uh, telling people, they were trying to promote a new chicken sandwich, and they have a, an ad that tells you to use that hashtag, which you can't use on Twitter. So whoever was doing that, um, I guess yet another case of uh, social media gurus who don't use social media. And um, <laughs> speaking of social media gurus, um, there's an agency in Brussels called Happiness Brussels, and they have a recruitment ad with images of um, Christian Bale and Steve Carell and badass Jesse Eisenberg, and they're telling people they should play retweet bingo. And so you're supposed to prove your social media prowess by getting your tweets retweeted by Barack Obama, The Guardian, Le Soir, uh, you know, all uh, accounts that have millions of followers. And um, the uh, co-creative director, Nick I juice Bo, I think you say his name, um, says anybody can sling cute messages into the world via social media, but if you can get your audience to retweet the bingo card, then you're really making a point. So we're on the hunt for the best social media influencers, or as Steve Hall at AdRant so succinctly put it, or just annoying pieces of shit who bug the crap out of public figures until they relent and retweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should you manage to jump through all the hoops and you have to like get across the bingo card, so you have to get like five across or five diagonally, um, and you'll get a six-month gig. And uh, they have great accounts. They have Toyota, they have Bacardi, they have Nivea, and they'll give you a gold iPhone. Uh, but you know, if you have actual social media management experience, you know not to behave that way. So don't apply. <laughs> so, harassing public figures, which one has the, uh, has the potential of uh, backlash written all over it once they discover what's going on and call, call that out, right? Right. And, I mean, uh, what a bad idea. Maybe, uh, I maybe, guess they will find someone to do that, and they will hire them. <laughs> And making people jump through a lot of hoops to do what you're, you know, it's, it's sort of you try and help people do things easily online, right? The easier the better. So, I don't know. We'll see. It's just everything you shouldn't do. But, um, and here's one, and I think yours is going to be like this as well, Dave, but there's so much good about this, but then I have to wonder, why did it take so long to happen, and why isn't there a woman anywhere in this campaign? Uh, the White House released an anti-rape campaign this week, a PSA called One is Too Many, and it features Joe Biden, Daniel Craig, Benico Del Toro, Dulé Hill, Seth Meyers, Steve Carell, and they're talking about intervening if a, social, if a sexual assault happens and refraining from victim blaming, which is pretty prevalent in the world. And Obama even shows up at the end to underscore that this is so important, and the tagline is, if she doesn't consent or if she can't consent, it's rape, it's assault, it's a crime, it's wrong. You can't be more clear than that. But then I wonder, why isn't there a woman anywhere in this video? Yeah, I uh, I don't know that uh, I think I, I didn't ha really have a problem with that because I think it's you know it's directed at men. Men are the ones who instigate uh, uh, sexual assault almost entirely, and uh, 
and uh, they're more likely to hear about it from somebody who's doing it, you know, uh, so they're more likely to be able to be in a position to intervene. Um, so I don't know that I necessarily uh, uh, had a problem with there not being a woman in the video. I did think it was, uh, it is a long time in coming. This is an issue that has been around forever. So, uh, well, you know, what they, never, I guess. But absolutely, what they also did, which I think was fascinating on their part, is they named 55 schools that have issues with sexual assault on campus. My guess is that every school has issues with sexual assault on campus. But you know, they are really time. Something has to be done. It shouldn't have taken this long. It's here. That's why I'm saying it's like both the best and. And the worst, you know, it's uh, it's an issue that's not going away anytime soon, and to see it at this higher level is certainly heartening. Um, it has to stop. That's all there is to it, and one is too many. And you know, to see all these guys in it is that's great, and to see the president actually in it is great. But I I just wish that it had happened sooner. That's all. Yeah. 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 So uh, my worst um, is what everybody has probably heard about from now, uh, by now. Uh, Donald Sterling, the uh, owner of the LA Clippers, uh, his voicemail, or not a voicemail, but a voice conversation, a phone conversation with his girlfriend who is Mexican and black, um, of him complaining that she is taking pictures and sharing it on Instagram of her her with uh, black people, of her with minorities, and he's complaining about that. Why do you have to do that in public? I don't care what you do in private, but don't bring them to my games. Don't bring Magic Johnson to my games. Uh, it was stunning in its, its, uh, its racism. It was a private conversation. They clearly are no longer together because it sure looks like she shared the voice, the recording of the uh, conversation with TMZ who has it on their, on their site and I encourage everybody to listen to it. It's nine minutes long, nine minute long conversation. Um, she says she didn't do it, but you know who did. She said she shared it with a few friends and that one of them probably needed money. Give me a break. Well, that's a that's a it, you can't be naive enough to think that it's not going to end up on TMZ if you're sharing it with somebody, right? But um, really? <laughs> she uh, so it blew up, and obviously um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of negative backlash backlash against this. The NBA is like 85 percent African American players, so that was not going to stand, right? I mean, predictably, the chatter online, I tracked it through Topsy, Donald Sterling uh, was mentioned 2.1 million times, LA Clippers 250,000 times, racism 945,000 uh, times. So that, that you know, the, the conversations over this, uh, this story uh, exploded online. LA Clippers ticket sales tanked 24 uh, hours before the game. Almost twice as many tickets were available on the secondary market uh, at the same point uh, before the Clippers' last home game on April 21. That's according to uh, Ticket Spy data. So, you know, obviously there's a huge, huge, huge problem with that. Um, uh, it's another example of just overt racism that we see that's sad, um, but also there's a public relations problem for the NBA. There's, um, you know, so they, they dealt with it, and that goes into the, the plus side of it, is the guy's been banned by the NBA commissioner um, for life. Um, he's been fined $2.5 million. They're going to force, they're going to try and force him out. Um, so the NBA did what they needed to do from a uh, business standpoint to resolve the situation. They did it quickly, so plus and minus, bad and good. I thought it was really pretty remarkable when the players in unison all took their jackets off and threw them on the floor and yeah. walked off, you know. I mean, but it brings up this other point about, you know, privacy and whether there is any anymore and when will people learn that if you don't want somebody to hear something you've said, don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? I mean, what did he think would ultimately happen with, with that kind of a tirade? 
to the person he did it to. And I wonder what kind of relationship they had that she turned around and sold it to TMZ, but that's a whole other issue. You know, but I mean, enough of this already. Racism has not gone away. It is not going away. And it's time for it to be gone. That's yep. really the bottom line. There's an interesting aspect of this too. Mark Cuban, who is another, uh, you know, a very popular businessman, but uh, an NBA, another NBA owner, who came out and said, "Well, it's something that he said on a, in a private conversation, and if you can have those ramifications, then that's scary." That that uh, basic, and I understand what he's saying. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you're you've got a business that's a public business that. You're expressing these views. Um, you know, there's there's a there's an issue of just desserts right here. You know, there is. I, I mean, there is the issue of what is a private conversation. Is there such a thing anymore? And and I understand why that could be scary, but I also don't understand why that conversation would ever take place. So, you know, let's go to best stuff. <laughs> 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 okay, so in the early days of the internet, before some of our listeners were born, the first, <laughs> the first um, internet sensation was Burger King's subservient chicken. Well, and Burger King is just has always had very weird advertising, and um, this was definitely weird, and it was also hilarious, and it was a person dressed in a chicken suit who was with uh, garters for some strange reason and, and stockings and sitting in this shabby looking living room and, and programmed in such a way that when you would type in dance or pee on the couch or uh, you know do jumping jacks or whatever that as long as it wasn't x-rated the chicken would do it and, and what happened, this is now remember pre-YouTube, pre-social media, this is 2004 and this Chicken was viewed one billion times. This is pre-YouTube, remember. So the chicken, unfortunately, didn't really sell much chicken, um, and and these things generally don't. And and then he was followed by the king, who was so creepy. And <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was so creepy. Why would you buy chicken from somebody who had a creepy mascot like that? But all of these were meant to appeal to kids, and maybe they did, but they didn't seem to cause anybody to buy chicken. So now, ten years later, the chicken's back, and um, it's really very funny. Whether it will sell chicken remains to be seen. Um, not to this vegetarian, uh, but. Uh, so there's this wonderful video about what the chicken's been doing for the past 10 years, and it'll be on TV. It was launched on Wednesday, and you know it said he rose from rose to fame, he fell from grace, and what's he been doing? And now he's back. And what he was doing was, you know, he was on the street and he was homeless, and and then someone came along and said, "Come on, you know, I'm going to fix you up," and took him into the gym and got him into shape, and he's back. And you know, I don't know where this leads from here, but you know, I just find it hilarious that he's back, and I don't know whether this will fly. I really don't. But this was um, this was Crispin Porter um, back in the day, and they're not involved in it now, which is also sort of interesting. But um, they're you know, it's back. Take a look. It's subservientchicken.com. I don't know whether he's going to do your bidding. Oh, and if you ask him to do something naughty, he just walk up to the screen and wag his. <laughs> uh, I guess it was his claw. At, you, know, you know, don't ask me to do that. You could tell him take a nap on the couch. But they had him programmed to do like ten thousand things that you could type in. This was the beginning of the interactive internet for real. And you know, nobody's actually come close to anything quite that weird or quite that clever. So I'm glad he's back. I love the subservient chicken. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, that was a fantastic campaign, campaign back in the day, and uh, they're doing. I think this is a very smart uh, revival of it. I mean, really, it's you know, you're not going to sell any chicken online. You're not going to sell any sandwiches online. It's a branding play, 
uh, and they're getting the most out of it they can possibly do. I mean, it's uh, it was popular, so a revival of it is going to get them earned media. They've got uh, some clever angles to. The, I mean, love the backstory of what happened to the, uh, the sort of uh, behind the music type of uh, type of uh, uh, style of uh, of documentary of what happened to uh, Subservient Chicken in the years past. So, uh, yeah, it's a good play. I like it. Adorable. <laughs> you know, we'll see. I mean, I don't know if it sells chicken. The other thing that, that I think is really quite good, and, and, and if you listen to us, you know I'm not a big Facebook fan. Um, Facebook now has an anonymous login that they're testing with certain developers, but what a lot of people don't realize is that as convenient as it is to log into sites using Facebook, every time you use Facebook authentication, those sites get access to all of the data you have shared with Facebook, including your friends' data. So a lot of people don't get that, and they're just giving their data away, and then they complain there's no privacy. Hello, wake up. Um, but Facebook is now testing this anonymous login, and that means you'll be able to log in without giving away your data, according to Facebook's press release, which said, and this is hilarious, I quote, people tell us they're sometimes worried about sharing information with apps and want more choice and control over what personal information apps receive. Today's announcement puts power and control squarely in people's hands, and it, it gives you an easy way of, sh of trying an app without sharing your Facebook information. And uh, there's a new version of your Facebook login that most people don't ever bother even to look at that gives you the option to pick and choose the information that apps will get. And they have a redesigned uh, app panel, so you can see what apps you've actually given these privileges to. And, um, you know, for this, um, I think Facebook gets kudos because they're actually showing you that you're sharing your public profile, your friend list, your email address, your birthday, your likes, and whatever else you've shared with Facebook, unless you tell them not to. Yeah, I used to say that uh, people talk a good game about privacy, but uh, when it comes down to it, they don't really care. Um, well, clearly, nobody bothered to find out. You know, people have argued with me that, no, you're not giving away all your personal information. I'm like, yes, you are. Every time you log in with Facebook, every time you use an app, you are giving away all of the information you have shared with Facebook. And, yeah. you know, why would people want to do that? You're right, they don't care. I think people are. I think uh, people are increasingly concerned about privacy, their data security, all that. I think that's that's growing in importance, uh, generally speaking. But also, I wonder how much of a difference this makes. I think it probably benefits Facebook more to put this in place and say, "We've got. We've, we're providing you the tools." But how many people actually do use those privacy tools that are offered? They really don't. Right. They really don't. I mean, people don't. And, you know, people just, I don't know why they don't understand that they're giving away their information every time they use a Facebook login, but they don't. It's not a secret. If you go and you look in the um, settings, which you have to go like 43 layers into to find, you, <laughs> you can see that those things are, are happening. Uh, I, I have another really great uh, content share, and I uh, kudos to an agency called um, Denizen. And in order to promote their content marketing, their content creation services, um, they have this hilarious video of tiny hamsters eating tiny burritos. And it's had 4.5 million views, like, just in a couple of days. And they, they actually make these little bitty burritos, and they put them on a table with a tablecloth for the little tiny hamster to come. <laughs> and eat. And the way he does it is probably the cutest thing you ever saw in your life. He eats both of them without apparently chewing them. I don't know if it's in his cheeks, but it's the cutest thing you ever saw. And, you know, it just it really shows that this is an agency that can create viral video for you. They don't even have to say anything about it. They just put it up there and say, we create content marketing. What? Yeah, it, it was very cute. I mean, one, you, you, hamsters, animals, you can't go wrong with animals on the Internet, right? Two, um, <laughs> He was stuffing them in his cheeks. So I don't know that he was eating them. I think he was saving them for later. And uh, <laughs> but the beginning of it was really, really uh, clever. They had the the chef chopping up tiny little bits of onion and tiny little bits of ingredients and wrapping it up in a tiny tortilla and everything. And then standing back in the corner and waiting 
anxiously. To see if he would eat it. If he would eat it, and oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so adorable. I mean, and, and watching it once isn't enough. You have to go, what was that? <laughs> you know, so, and then you go, who did that? And and there they are. You know, it leads you to this agency. And if you go and look at the rest of their work, it's Dennis and Company. They're fabulous. We'll put it in the notes. Just one. I've got. I've got a um, content marketing, video content marketing example that I came across. As you know, I'm a guitarist. You see my guitars behind me here. Uh, so YouTube is the be is a beautiful, beautiful tool for guitarists because all you need to do is how to play whatever song you want to learn how to play, and somebody's created a video about how to play that song. So I do it all the time. ProGuitarShop.com recognizes that dynamic as well, and uh, so they've got a YouTube channel. Um, I search for uh, how to play the Cars song, your, my be best friend's girlfriend, uh, because I want to learn how to play that. So I uh, came across their video of how to play that. So it's titled How to Play uh, Cars, My Best Friend's Girlfriend. And uh, what you get is the guy who's going to teach you how to play guitar doing the opening riffs of the, of the, of the song. And then... Um, he pauses and mentions that uh, some history of the song, written in 1977, the Cars played live concerts using an Ampeg amp, and uh, we've got these pedals that give you that very same sound. So we'll give you the Ampeg amp sound, sound, and we've got a, a re reverb pedal and a chorus pedal and stuff that'll give you the sound of the that actual song. So they're selling the things that they they're they're telling you things of interest related to the song, you'd naturally be interested in the history of it, plus they're plugging the products that they've got, and then they mentioned, by the way, we've got Free Pedal Friday, so if you click on this link, every Friday you have a chance of winning a free pedal from us, so they've got an engagement aspect to it. And then they go on and teach you how to play the song. Very, very smart content marketing play. It's a terrific video, and when I played it, I also got an ad, uh, it wasn't for them, but it was from a custom-made guitar company and it said, is your guitar making it painful for you to play? And it showed, like, the indentations on the player's fingers that were really all red because, you know, if they do. If you don't have a good guitar, that happens. And it said, you know, we can fix that for you. And there was, I forget what the second thing was, but it was talk about, con you know, advertising in context because the first time it was some completely unrelated ad, but the second time I watched it, it had that. So I thought that was pretty smart of... YouTube because you would in fact be interested. Well, they're targeting they're targeting with that beginning players who don't yet have the calluses built up on their fingers, and that's why you know. So uh, they they're very micro targeting in that advertising. That's it's interesting. really cool. So I, I we can go on to uh, our shiny objects, and and I, um, I I look for things like this. You know, I, it makes me crazy that people go to dinner and they sit with their phones and and that they are tweeting and not talking to each other. So this Japanese fashion designer named Kune, Kunehiko Moriaga, um, he has come up with a collection that shields electromagnetic waves to protect us from the storm of information that we experience <laughs> on a daily basis. So that means that when somebody texts or calls you, they get the message, sorry, the number you dialed is not available. And it's a collaboration between him and a company called Party and AID DCC and Trident Gum, go figure. But um, his stuff is really cutting edge kind of fashion. And I mean, I love the way all of it looks and the idea that when you wear it, nobody can call you or text you is fabulous. Why can't they do that to the upholstery of cars? I don't like that idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You and I should not have dinner. <laughs> Why not? You want to? You want to be texting and tweeting? <laughs> but I like I like all of these things, like where you go in a bar and they make you leave your phone at the door, like your gun in the Wild West. You know, I mean, I like all these things. I would wear these clothes. <laughs> I would turn off my phone, actually. But <laughs> there's another one that um, everybody's sick in in New York right now because. Unfortunately, the weather's been so insane. Like the other day, it was um, 20 in the evening, and we had more rain in one day than we had during Hurricane Sandy. And then the next day, it was um, 68. So everybody is sick. So there's this um, new app. It's called Sick Weather, and it's kind of like Foursquare for illness. And um, when somebody publicly posts, like my kids have strep or on Facebook or Twitter, 
they somehow qualify that report and um, they make a, uh, a pl they plot it on a map and so when you're traveling near that report like if you're dropping your kids off at school where everybody has the mumps you get a real-time alert on your phone saying everybody here has the mumps and so it's sort of like a Doppler radar for illness and uh, it's the only app that um, combines disease surveillance from social media with uh, iOS geofencing and local notification. So it serves real-time six-zone alerts. And the latest version adds crowdsourcing so that people can report illness directly and anonymously on the app. It's really very cool. That's very cool. That's very cool. That's uh, similar to, but a different version of uh, Google's Flu Trend Tracker, where Google yeah. tracks um, geographic searches for flu symptoms and flu those types of things that indicate that somebody's got the flu. So, uh, very interesting. When you think about the implications for other sorts of research, it's very interesting. You know, just yeah. the fact that this is built into the iOS and the combinations that they're using are, uh, you know, with Twitter, which is surprising. Um, so, uh, you know, this is this is something that's worth watching, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think it has tremendous in implications for public health. Uh, anticipating outbreaks of diseases uh, is, you know, clear application of that. Um, Who do you think will buy them? Good question. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but that's that's a good question. <laughs> I'd buy them if I had enough money. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I don't. That's not going to happen. So my shiny my shiny object is a site called uh, Site Alerts. S i t e alerts dot com. It is a cre It's a new site created by um, a co-founder of HubSpot. And what it does is give you insights on any website. So you type in a uh, website and it will give you traffic sources broken out by search, social, email, refers, direct traffic, paid uh, traffic. Um, it'll give you a handful of organic keywords that are driving traffic to the site. Social refers, it'll break out those, those by social channel. Um, it gives a marketing grade so HubSpot, this is directly from HubSpot's playbook, Hub, HubSpot had some grader tools back in the day, they've got a marketing grader now, but they used to have a Twitter grader that would give you uh, analytics on Twitter accounts. Uh, so this will give you Twitter followers for that domain, Facebook fans, inbound links, traffic rank, um, any mentions, uh, technology that they're using, so uh, I saw the New York Times has like Twitter hover cards they're using on their site. Um, and then you can e get email updates, so you can get updates on that domain. So a great um, analytics tool for doing opposition research. For doing, I look at you know media outlets and see how much uh, how much uh, what their online presence is for a media outlet for um, um, earn media efforts and stuff like that. So is that a free app? It is free. Yes. Well, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, that's pretty feature rich for a free app. The, the other one you you. Um, used earlier in the NBA story was the uh, one called Topsy. I think that's pretty impressive too. Yeah, Topsy is great. Topsy is great for, uh, for uh, especially getting insight into um, online chatter that's already happened. They were bought out by Twitter, so um, so we'll see if that remains as a standalone tool or if uh, Twitter eventually integrates it into their own analytics, which are sorely lacking, so they could use, use that uh, right into Twitter. So. Um, shall we wrap it up with the daily numbers? Yeah, that brings us to the daily numbers. All right, so this is Americans' 50-year predictions. So what Americans believe will happen in 50 years. This is from Re uh, Pew Research Center. And um, percent of adults who feel that the following will or won't happen in the next 50 years. Lab-grown custom organs for transplant. 15% say it won't happen. 81% said yes, we'll be able to get lab-grown custom organs for transplant. Or 3D printed, one or the other. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, computers create art as well as humans do. 45% don't believe it'll happen. 51% uh, believe it will happen. Scientists will have solved teleportation. I'm skeptical of this. I'm with the 56% who don't believe it'll happen. 39% do believe it will happen. I just, the physics of it don't 
make any sense. Humans will have long-term space colonies. 64% do not believe it'll happen in the next 50 years. 33% say it will uh, happen in the next 50 years. I don't know if it's going to be the next 50 years, but I believe it'll happen. Um, humans will control the weather. Last one. Drum roll, please. Be all worry on this. Will, will, will humans control the weather or not? Ah, oh, you've muted yourself because of the, because of the traffic outside. Seventy-seven percent uh, say humans will not control the weather, and nineteen percent uh, say they will in the next fifty years. I don't believe they will. So there we go. The daily numbers for this week. I'm still looking for the drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are really un Pew-like questions. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. Pew is usually such serious research, and and questions like that are kind of funny. I mean, they're not usually ones for fun questions, but, um, you know, outer space and, and replacement organs, of course they're going to happen. I, I went to a conference where they said we, we can already make replacement eyeballs and, you know, blindness will be cured in the next... That, that was really 2025, so that's not so far away. Um, but, no, 2045. But, you know, I love that. I... I <laughs> I think that people are, uh, are pretty pretty interested in those questions, and, and it's, it's fascinating to me that Pew would be the one to do that yeah. research. I would expect that to come from some other source. Yeah. Anyway, that does bring us to the end of the episode 46 of the Beyond Social Media Show. Thank you for watching. And uh, you can find Dave Erickson on Twitter at D Erickson. You can find him on estrategyblog.com and eStrategy TV. You can find me. I'm at What's Next on Twitter. My website is Maximum-Plus.com for all things Google+. And my blog is What's Next Blog.com. You will find the Beyond Social Media Show on our blog, BeyondSocialMediaShow.com, where we will post the playlist later today with links to everything we talked about. We will put uh, timestamps on the video so that you will be able to just click on the time to go to any segment that you are interested in. And we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs>